somewhere near the middle of nowhere America, past the abandoned coat room of a museum that no one remembers and fewer liked to begin with, beyond the incredibly significant coffee table and the styrofoam block of meaning, a secret society huddles around a cell phone flashlight, desperately dodging the deep deceptions and draconian dictates of a global conspiracy to scrutinize those films which are rumored to drive viewers to madness and dissolution, and maybe dry off their soggy togs and find something to eat. Draw closer, dear listener. Let your trembling ears sup upon the eldritch knowledge of the Cinemania Society. We, we the, the fellows of the Lenses of Palm do convene to judge if it's a fine cinema worthy of our esteem, or whether it should be cast down as worthless as hokum. Let us start our friends in the judgment. We the fellows of the story so far. Following a series of visually stunning and elaborate gun battles with mysterious and metaphorical malicious militias, the Cinemania Society is taking it easy in an abandoned art museum and looking at 1985's Angel's Egg, a dense layered spectacle of meaningfulness from Japan. In a surreal prog rock album cover world, a mysterious guy and a mysterious girl do mysterious things mysteriously and refuse to explain themselves in any way. There are angels, there are eggs, and it's all just so very meaningful. What does it mean? We don't know. What is knowing? That's just mean. We rejoin our heroes as they flee deeper into the museum, scattered and shaken as the metaphors hunt them. Zack? Daniel? Is anyone here? I'm here! I'm here! Anybody at all? My standards are low, but not, I hasten to add, non existent. You know this is all their fault. Oh, 100%. How do we let them talk us into these asinine situations? It's not like they ever listen to me. Right? What's the whole deal with this high council anyway? Why are they after us? It's a long story. Wait, do you hear that? What? Footsteps. Soon to be dead footsteps. Wait, 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 wait. Before you go rage mode... Anyway, if you look over here at this part, I think what it means... Oh, this I way. I think I heard Ethan. Um, the egg is... Hurrah! Indicative of... Oh! And Brother Methuselah. Hurrah. More like he found me staring at some floor tile. It was a very intricate pattern, see? With these interesting splotches of red mixed in. What I really like about it is... Uh, look, look here. How you have this bony lion coming up out of the bottom left corner. It's small relative to the giant egg that dominates this piece, but it is a clear metaphor for how the consumer is actually an insignificant speck relative to the thing it is trying to consume in our grotesque, late capitalist society where medium is the message. No, 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 no. Are you blind? That's not a lion. That's a goddamn angel. Look, it's got wings and everything. This is clearly a metaphor for God. I'm pretty sure that's the ketchup stain. Damn, a dead end. Relax, everyone. I got the door. <laughs> hey, guys. Fuck. <laughs> all right, all right. It's all quiet. I think we're safe in here. On with the conclave. Fuck! All right. It begins to rain in rotoscoped Bordeaux, and those creepy frozen workmen from before come to life. They run past wielding long, rope-wrapped harpoons, chasing the shadows of massive fish. Looks like... A coelacanth to me, swimming across the faces of buildings, the road, everywhere. The men chuck their harpoons, but of course, they pass right through. Leave it to this film to make even the most exciting scene. Till now, a total blue ball special. Man the harpoons, it's a completely harmless shadow fish. Uh, yeah, let's, I mean, again, still trying to figure out why the coelacanth? You know, like, are they supposed to, they're, they're clearly supposed to be whalers. I mean, you hunt whales with harpoons, you don't hunt coelacanth. They don't grow that big either. Uh, I mean, they were probably just discovered around the same time he was writing this, so maybe he was just like, hey, cool. They find, well, yeah, I guess everybody was still wowed about the fact that they found this prehistoric fish ancestor that people were like, look, it has fins that are kind of like limbs. Maybe this was the thing that walked on Earth the first time. Right, and they're meant to be like a callback to, you know, biblical times, and like this is an ancient creature that was just a memory and so forth. So he's like, "Hey, let's get a really old fucking fish." Because you know the Bible is really good at resolving issues with fossils. 
<laughs> Resolve right. them with harpoons. Right, right. Also, harpoons, not phallic at all. Oh, Speaking no, Satan this. placed fossils in order to dissuade people from believing in the Bible. They were, they were put there by Satan. Speaking of which, they smash a bunch of windows and lamps as they chuck their harpoons around. It's all very meaningful and saying something. Probably fuck coelacanth stay in the Devonian era, you bastard protofish. Yeah. Yeah. Bells ring out in the distance, but Pretty Boy and the girl have fucked off into the wilderness and away from post-apocalyptic Bordeaux. As they move across the windy grassland full of rocks, girl turns to dude and insists he promised not to do anything to her egg. Okay. Presumably this is hours or days after having met him, but now is the time she decides to set that boundary. Better late than never, I guess. To be fair, after five minutes in this place, I would want to smash the shit out of something to just drown out the deafening, endless silence. He looks at her with seeming contempt. He's going to do something to that egg, just watch. This is why you can never trust close-up magic performers. They come to a cave that looks like it should be infested by xenomorphs. Yeah, yeah, really. Oh, yeah, no, those are those are some top-shelf xenomorphic uh, <laughs> facades to this cave. Which Listen, <laughs> rotoscoped apocalyptic Bordeaux has a high dollar value. <laughs> right? Which uh, would be a welcome change of pace, to be honest. If it was infested with xenomorphs, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> then you'd have to nuke the movie from orbit. It's the only way you <laughs> <laughs> I think we should do that anyway, just to be sure. It's the only way you can be sure. So anyway, so she stands up on the vertebrae of some vast beast, and they look at a huge, organic-looking boss relief of a tree on the wall. He says he's seen something like it a long time ago, a huge, life-sucking tree that swelled into a black sky holding a giant egg with a giant bird sleeping in it. Okay, the girl wants to know what happened to the bird. But uh, Pretty Boy here says it's still there and dreaming. So on that tweet. On that tweet, uh, the girl wants to know what the bird's dreaming about. But dude wants to know what's in the egg. The whole conversation is pretty egg-centric. Hey. Mm. I'm ashamed of myself. One thing's for sure, Cthulhu the Saint. I mean, like they get the, uh, what is the giant sphere supposed to be Cthulhu? Or is the giant sphere supposed to be the egg grown to full maturity? Or anyway, there needs to be more Cthulhu in this, like given all of the, the giant depth, uh, you know, imagery and things rising from the deep and post apocalypses. And there needs to be fucking Cthulhu something around. Well, you in order Cthulhu for... in everything. Yes. I mean, like you watch the truth about cats and dogs and you want Cthulhu in that. <laughs> I mean, you know what they say, what has fallen asleep while watching endless art house cinema can never truly die. I think uh, <laughs> there needed to be more Cthulhu and eat, pray, love. <laughs> <laughs> eat, eat the world, pray, love. <laughs> <laughs> no, there needed to be Cthulhu and uh, love, actually. <laughs> Wasn't that Bill Nighy? No, that was Hugh Grant. <laughs> no, no, no. But I'm saying uh, Cthulhu in that movie was Bill Nighy. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, okay, so elsewhere else when they ascend a spiral staircase that is absolutely lined with more water-filled flasks and decorated with the bones of vast creatures there's loads more hr geiger-esque wall decor i'm telling you girl sets down her flask at the end of a long long line of them which finally explains her obsession i guess she's been at this whole flask filling collecting thing for a good long while Glassware and harpoons. That's what Bordeaux is known for. It's like Heisenberg from Breaking Bad just like left all his detritus around. Pretty Boy wants to know if she's been here as many days as bottles. We feel like we've been here that long. He says he's forgotten where he's from, but admits he might never have known at all. She wants to know if he'll be going away. Tired out from all that talk. I mean, we're talking a solid 10 or 11 lines of dialogue between them. That's a lot. They uh, switch back to contemplating the rain some more. A lot of meaningless dialogue. Good contemplating going on right there. Some real solid contemplating. Yeah, yeah, no, like gold star. Uh, eventually, the pretty boy gets his wind back and recounts the story of the flood in Genesis. You know, the one about God's wrath and regret of creation when he brought the rains. Not just down in Africa, but on everything, everywhere, all at once. But this is the early version, the depressing one that didn't test well with audiences. <laughs> Instead, the doves Noah sent out to test for land never came back. 
the people waited and waited, just growing up and living on the Ark for years and years with what food and water is clearly not important to this story. But eventually, so much time passed, everyone forgot about the doves and the flood and the world they came from entirely. Also, all the animals on the Ark turned to stone, which is just fucking wild. I don't remember anything about flesh to stone in the Bible, like no Medusa action whatsoever. Oh, no, no. I mean, there was not. He he He's making it up himself to fit his imagery. But um, but no, I think the deviation is is intentional. Um, yeah, improv- but, improvising on the Bible, just like I'm DIY uh, Zen koans. Anyhow, Pretty Boy says it was so long ago, he can't remember where and when he saw the giant bird fetus and life-sucking tree. He and everyone else who survived have been drifting around on that giant spherical unicron arc with its millions of petrified people and animals for so long that he suspects it may have have all been a dream. Like the fish shadows the fishermen Uh, specters were chasing, uh, really just the lingering memories of a dead person. Or maybe nobody exists and it's just raining outside. It can't be that simple. You think that's a head scratcher? I'm still trying to figure out if I'm too stoned or not stoned enough for this shit. Not stoned enough by by far. Yeah. No, but that's what I mean. Like, I think this is all really, really intentional. No, I think, honestly, this is one of those movies that you really have to, like, you really do have to be on mushrooms to get the full effect of it. So, like, you don't understand why Pink Floyd sounds the way it sounds like until you're on a good dose of mushrooms. And then you're like, I get it. Oh, I get it. Okay, cool. This is why this is the way it is. All right. Okay. Yeah. This is my third time around on the film. I watched a couple of times in college and generally around there. And then for this, um, I was sober for every single one. Stone Hmm. sober. But I have an English degree, which basically means I'm stoned all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. Mine at last. Oh, yes. I shall protect you. Uh you got there, buddy? Hmm? What? You know this? Oh, don't worry about it. Stop questioning me. How dare you? Look over there. Convenient distraction. You see nothing. Is that... Is that an egg? What would you say if I said it was, indeed, an egg? Well, unless you laid it yourself, I suppose I'd get over the shock. I found it on a plinth. It's mine now. Look at the perfect curviness, the absolute egginess, the symmetry, the divine roundy pointy bit. Uh, it's a very significant egg, I guess. It is. It is a significant egg, and I shall guard it from your jealous eyes. Stop eyeing so jealously. Oh, come on. It's just an egg. Who cares? Why is an egg so significant anyway? Why is an egg so sig- Why is anything so significant? In fact, Let me tell you something. I need to take you back to, let's say, the 1920s in the Soviet Union, where cinema was just starting to be developed as an art form. There was a director, possibly one of the first real directors to ever exist, called Lev Kuleshov. Now, he was the, the, the teacher of Eisenstein. He developed film theory. He developed the idea of there being a film theory. And he came up with something that was later called the Kuleshov effect. Let me describe it to you. I show you a picture of, oh, let's say, a beautiful hot dinner, and then a picture of a happy looking family. Now, putting them next to each mm-hmm. other makes you think of plenty and good times and everyone getting lots to eat. Now I show you that same picture of a dinner. Then I show you a picture of a starving peasant. Putting them next to each other suddenly creates an image of injustice, hunger, poverty. The thing is, when you put things next to each other, the context actually creates meaning. Kuleshov discovered this, and it later became the basis of Soviet montage cinema. You create context by putting things next to each other and creating meaning out of it. In Angel's Egg, there are all these images. They're images we've all seen before from Judeo-Christian imagery. The egg, the man with a cross, the wounded hands, water, carrying water, heaven, earth, angels, statues, evolution, the flood, the fish. These 
these are all images that when put together into a narrative create what we think of as the Judean Christian mythos. What Mamru Oshi has done is taken these, snipped them apart and put them next to each other in a kind of mental Kuleshov effect to create a new context and a new meaning. That's why there hmm. are all these ideas of, of faith that we all recognize, but they're out of order. They're put in mm -hmm. different ways together, and so they're creating a completely new meaning in the eyes of the audience. It's all done to create a new mood, a new kind of significance. Now, this means that, in my opinion, this is not, in fact, a film about faith at all. This is an artistic response to faith. It's taking the ideas and the images, cutting them up and creating a montage out them to create a totally new thing. And so if you look for an exploration of faith, you won't find one because all of the ideas are in the wrong order and in the wrong places, but they're creating a new context with each other. So the mood of the thing is kind of faith-based, but it's totally new. It's a Kuleshov effect. That's why the egg is significant eh? um anyway that's how i see it and hey where did it go hmm? hope hmm. what what's in the sandwich hope uh -huh. you better not it's <laughs> it's an enigma hmm? one of those things you know embrace the mystery it's not a mystery. You did that on purpose. Look, it's simple. God meets man. God gives man egg. Man tries to eat egg. Man gets ketchup on color. I hate you. Let's just get on with it. Bathroom break. How old was that egg you ate? Ha! <laughs> That'll teach you. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. A library card? Seriously? He just wanted to make an old video game reference. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it. I'll go with you. Thanks. I really just needed a break. Oh, hey, look at this. Is that an actual painting? Yeah, of a library. It, it kind of reminds me of... Of... Your bookshop. My, my bookshop. Well, at least this makes sense. Unlike everything in that fucking movie. What was the deal with her putting the egg under her dress all the time? Isn't there a better way to carry an egg? Ironically, when I first saw the film, I thought she was pregnant until she took it out from under her dress. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, an egg. I mean, that, that can't have been an accident that she looked pregnant carrying the egg around. There's so much um, parallel between this, this faith that she has and that she wants to protect the egg, but she doesn't. When he asked if she, if she wanted to know what's inside, she said no, like she wasn't ready mm -hmm. to see what's inside. And that's, you can draw a lot of parallels between that and actual, you know, human pregnancy you know i've been there and i remember there's only so much you can know and so much you can see you have to have a lot of faith in what the outcome is going to be and as much as you do want to see what's in there you also don't because while they're in there they're safe and they're protected and they want for nothing and they need nothing you know everything is provided instantly and they're comfortable and as soon as they're out it's so much more effort to keep them safe and keep them comfortable and they're in this big scary world so as much as you want to see what's in there and you want to know, at the same time, you want to keep it in, you know, keep everything there and keep them safe. And I wonder if the, the creators of this movie thought, I mean, I'm sure they thought some of that. There's this, it's a, um, a juxtaposition. You want to see them and know them, but you also want to keep them in there and keep them safe. You know, she doesn't want to open the egg because it's not, because it's everything in there is safe. And once you open it, it's, it's, there's so much more you have to do to keep it alive. So like, it's kind of the same as like blind faith. Like you can be, you can have blind faith in something and you don't have to confront any facts and you can just believe it. But as soon as it's like, there's a lot of Christian symbolism in here and people have faith and they believe 
you know, and Christ and God and whatever. If, but if they were actually, would they, if they actually met God or they met Jesus, then they'd have to confront, well, is this person real? Are they not? You know what I mean? As long as it's in that egg and it's in this neat little hypothetical package and it's all um, theoretical and, you know, it's all philosophical, it's easier to deal with. As soon as it becomes real, it's a lot harder to deal with. They're like physical and tangible. That faith is harder to have. But surprisingly, in the film, she thinks she knows what is in the egg because she shows us the skeleton on the wall of the, like, Mm -hmm. angel bird. So, like, in faith, you know, there's people, like, they know what happened in the past or they have their biblical, their religious texts, right, that tell them what happened or what will happen. So that's what they believe is going to happen. As much as they they don't want to confront it themselves, they feel like someone else has already confronted it or someone else will confront it in the future. So as long as it's there, then it's okay. And the same with pregnancy. Like, you've seen other people have babies. You've seen people grow up. So you know what's supposed to happen. You know, you're not ready to for that baby to be out and to see what's going to happen in your particular situation. But you have ideas and you have a, you have an idea of what's going to happen. And you have a, you have a plan, you know, and you have evidence from what's already happened. But then once you're actually in it, it's totally different than you think. <laughs> they hand you this I'm tiny sure. human being and they're like, okay, go home. Take care of a human being which you've never done before. Good luck. Mine were both, mine were both easy and mellow and no health problems. The second one had a little jaundice, but nothing serious. But I damn near died after the second one. I just wouldn't stop bleeding. So for like three days, they're like watching me. You're still really pale. That an analogy well yeah when she cracked open the egg you know and what she didn't crack it open that oh yeah sorry dude once it was cracked open. it open yeah i guess it's, and it's not really a choice will. right like in pregnancy it's not your choice there are probably women who if they had to choose to end like to be give birth like they would just never have the baby it would just stay pregnant you know it's one of those things that has to happen you don't really get a choice so i think that's actually kind of a good metaphor where he broke it open for her she didn't get the choice. You don't get to be ready or choose unless you're, you know, doing induction or whatever. But you know what I mean? It just happens naturally. And you're not in charge. You don't get to say, oh, I'm ready or I'm not ready or wait around. And then so the baby's, the, the egg is open and it's out. She's got to chase after it. She's got to catch up and be where everything is, whether she's ready or not. You know, whether you feel like you're ready for this or not, that baby's coming. Maybe that's an analogy for postpartum psychosis. I don't know. I thought that he killed the egg. And that's why she was so upset. He's just a dick. <laughs> no, I, um, I think he was forcing her. And then he leaves. Like, they, it had to be opened eventually. It couldn't stay in there forever. And she was never going to be ready to open it. But she couldn't be the one to decide when to open it. She couldn't be the one to decide when it was ready. So he had to kind of push her along. We don't know how long the egg has been an egg. No, that's, we don't. It could have been days. It could have been weeks. It could have been years. We just don't know. Honestly, if you look at pretty much any sci-fi, the main hero, if it's a man, is either Moses, Jesus, or Adam. And the main heroine is always Mary. It always comes back to that. You can, you can make that analogy to almost anything. We better get back before they get themselves killed. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? Oh, the roaches in the spice are huge. Wait, wait, that's not a, a, a Clark Nova. <laughs> How did you find oh. us? I oh, we left everywhere. that giant mutant cockroach typewriter behind. How long have you been here? I like to lurk in corners. Were you listening to us this whole time? Well, between us girls. Yeah. What did you hear? Hey, I'm a mutant insect typewriter. I record everything. That's troubling. So, Ed, huh? You know, this reminds me of when I disgorged my first clutch. They were covered in oil and bobbing around. Black and blue and green all over the place. I must have had about 500 of them. I only ate a couple, I swear. Well, you can lay eggs? I thought you were a male. Up the wall. Oh, 
I see some of the black meat. Oh, Andrew, let's go. Let's yeah, go. Let's Come get on. out of here. Let's go. Oh. 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 Wait, no, come back. I have such things to tell you. No one ever listens to the typewriter. Hold everything. I thought I heard something. Brother Zachariah. Hmm? What? Aren't you on watch? Uh, look at this piece, man. The letters that once glowed, the arrow, it points to the left. But you can tell from the subtle curve that if you really followed it, it would lead you in a circle back to where you started. See, this is art. It represents the impossibility of escaping the dharmic cycle of life. All life ends in death, and death makes way for new life. Figures, you'd be obsessed with the fire exit. <laughs> yeah, would you look at that? The door. Have you been watching the door? Apparently, yes. Look, it's right here. I can't help but wonder if it would have done us more good if you'd left it standing in the doorway. And I can't help but wonder if you should leave this stuff to the expert. Uh, too late, too late. The, uh, the metaphorcers. Ah, uh, it's like fighting shadows or battling phantoms or you know having a Donnybrook with spectres. Take two of these and see me in hell, bitch. Does anyone else feel like this whole battle has been kind of a metaphor? About, about violence and conflict being useless or something? That's exactly the kind of attitude I'd expect from someone without a flamethrower. Oh, oh, too steep! You know, like how we're fighting a bunch of convenient shadowy figures, but not really achieving anything. It's metaphorical. It's definitely meta. So what's a meta for? Ah, eat bear chop, you bastard. Or, at least, quasi meta. Sanctuary! We need sanctuary! <laughs> Hold on one second. I've been dying to try this out. Holy shit! D did it work? You blew straight through the wall, and there's a glowing crater the size of a dumpster in the next building! What even was that? It's, uh... Portable wave motion laser eyebrow trimmer. Aw, I want one of those. How come you get one of those? <laughs> I'm from space, old man. Did you bring enough for everyone? Uh, no, Professor. Shit, that barely slowed him down. They're flanking us. They're so deep and meaningful. So textured and layered. So ironic and yet so pertinent. Pertinent? They can be pertinent. That's a thing. <laughs> what are we going to do now, fellow geniuses? Uh, Genii? Geniosos? Uh, uh, hang on a second. I just need to get the pilot light going on my flamethrower. Wait! We can't solve this with violence. We have to look at the deeper underlying struggle. To err is human, but to be human is no error. What the fuck? What is he doing? He's starting to believe. He's an idiot. If you want to hunt like a pack, you must first pack for the hunt. I've read about this. I think he's using the dialectical approach. Is it actually working? I think so. Revenge. Disgrace. Blasphemy. That... that actually makes sense. Get a hold of yourself, man. It's the metaphors. They're in your brain. Crap, they're regrouping. Try changing it up. Uh, all right, okay. A cold heart can warm itself by the fire of companionship with a nice steaming cup of familiar faces. Oh, imagery, I get it. 
Nice try, but you're nothing but a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, but signifying nothing. I guess that's one way to put an English degree to use. You work that crippling student debt, baby. Oh, I get it. It's a metaphor. You don't get it at all. That's the best part. You don't have to get it when it's all just a metaphor. Ah, deep. Oh, shit, they've got a point. What? Are you okay? We don't even have a chapter house anymore. The easiest lies to swallow are your own. You guys know I don't actually talk to demons, right? At least, not regularly. Oh, shit, we're losing him. Can anyone else fight them off? Don't look at me. I can't just believe in whatever nonsense I make up. Yes. Oh, please. One step? I can do that. I've been working out. No! Stop him! I've got him! Profligator Daniel, get your head in the game! Can I even call myself a writer? You help write this bloody script. We've had to put up with that creepy bug typewriter ever since you made it a running gag. Oh, yeah. Clark Nova. Two wrongs don't make a right, but three rats make a left in New Jersey. Danny boy, you can do it. Do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> the rest is silent. Thank fucking Christ. No more no Christ, 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 Christ figures. figures. Shit, okay. Bloody hell. Even though it was a complicated mess of conflicted imagery and overwrought ideas, the whole thing sort of came together in the end. Now you're just being meta. And that's what a meta metaphor's for. Well, you got me there. What's a meta for you? Oh. Ooh, nothing. Nothing serious. I'm just wiped. They're gone, though. We're safe. Once again, we win? I guess? All I'm saying is, we could have given violence a chance. I can't Where in the hell are all these guys coming from? They're not using doors like civilized people, I can tell you that. Just keep firing! Get some! Incoming! I think they just died? Let's take the win and not ask questions. Come on, we're nearly finished. I think we can cut through the cafeteria of dismay. Then it's just the gift shop of melancholy on the left and we're out of here. Everyone is allowed to get one item, nothing fancy. Ooh, I want a novelty pencil. I want pamphlets. Oh, the pamphlets. Ooh, ooh, and maybe they have some cool books for my book. Oh, God damn it. I don't have a fucking bookstore anymore. I heard they have the bottomless donut holes of wistfulness and the bleakest, blackest coffee. That definitely fits my aesthetic. Hey, Andy, want to get a novelty souvenir? Yeah, for this film? What would that even look like? It's like a jigsaw puzzle made of raindrops. It's like a teapot full of shadows. Eh, it was pretty good, I guess. The important thing is, we managed to visit somewhere without ruining things for once. Um, <laughs> let's just go. Well, I guess there's another place we could never go back to. I'll add it to the list. Ugh. Just want to get out of this rain. 
Can we go somewhere that's dry next? Come on, we'll catch the next train out of this bleak, symbolist hellscape. We just have to wait at the station made of screaming statues. Well, while we're waiting, let's render judgment. Render judgment, I was just about to insist on that. I judge this film guilty on all counts. Overwhelmingly guilty. <laughs> Definitely guilty. I don't even know what the hell we just watched. Is it guilty? Is it not guilty? The charges don't even make sense. Make a decision. I decide that I hate Daniel for suggesting this movie. Is the film guilty or not guilty? I don't know. Guilty, I guess. I'm just mad. Thank you. My favorite part of this movie is during the first few seconds of the film when she just picks up the egg and looks at it and goes, I love this angel's egg. And uses the title of the film in the film and then goes into that long monologue where she explains the symbolism of the egg and what we're going to be watching for the next hour and a half. <laughs> and then I woke up and realized I was watching this film. It's guilty as fuck. <laughs> Personally, I think this movie tackles faith the way that American films tackle Eastern religions faith. We think it's weird. We don't really get it. But put it in a movie. People will watch it. When I saw <laughs> this, I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, wow. oh, really yeah, weird. That's pretty true. They totally People turn the tables. Like, They're like... Hmm, it's care, mystical like, and western. These, these Christians are bizarre. Like, look at all this crazy <laughs> shit. Let's put it in a movie. Eggs like, and rebirth and rabbits and shit. And, so, and giant arcs and stuff. Yeah, so why not? So what's funny is I, I have a fairly strong read on what I think this film is about with regard to faith and stuff, but that is such an amazing hot take. I, I You win. It's just when he's talking, he's reading the Bible verses and he meanders off into it. Yeah, and all of this is an existential, meaningless shit. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's like when someone's read like three like Buddhist verses and suddenly you, you know. Uh, Memory uh, Washi is not at all religious and certainly not a Christian. Oh, no. oh that's that's the point. That's I'm, pretty like, obvious. The director's like, yeah. Yeah, you're like definitely fun. coming to this as an outsider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when you start improving fucking verses from the, you know, from the Great Flood. Like, like I'm just gonna improv some Genesis pieces and just chuck that in there, right? Like that, that must have happened in the flood, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and then he's got this thing on his shoulder. It kind of looks like a machine gun, but it kind of looks like a cross. Like, what the fuck is going on? No, I mean, it looks cool. So let's do it. <laughs> it's like when someone knows like two things about Buddhism and suddenly decides that they're very enlightened and can quote. You know, quote the Buddha and exactly in lotus pose and stuff. You know, exactly. but it's turned on us. It's like instead of you know. Hey, like, hey, hey! I feel I personally know, attacked by the extremely religion. relatable content. <laughs> right, I know so much about Eastern religion. Now it's like, oh exactly. my gosh, this Western religion—it's so different and exotic. Like being exactly. exoticized is not, not something that Westerners are used to. No, not at all. Though I will say, I think that one is thing... totally what's happening here. It's exoticizing yes. Western religion. Well, yes, I, I will note one thing where I think it's a yes, but right there's I think there's a reason that he went for specifically the flood uh, like the, there's a really strong theme in Japanese uh, like pop culture, particularly anime and manga about um, post apocalypse, apocalypse, the destruction of the world, recovery, even even all of their cyberpunk stuff is very like something bad happened and we're kind of putting it back together. We're in the middle of like a slow apocalypse. Yeah, and that's Akira, because of, Akira. Yeah, it's because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? That is indelibly marked into the Japanese psyche. So no, Noah and is also, the apocalypse story of the Bible. So there's a reason well, that that one in particular story, resonated to him. The flood story and Noah were not original to the Bible. It's taken from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was like... Um, from Mesopotamia. Oh, like, yeah. this flood story has been passed down through generations and generations. It's not Western. It was Eastern before it was Western. Well, I mean, arguably, I mean, the Bible's been, not Western it's either. It's stolen and or you know, borrowed multiple times. I, I mean, the Old so, Testament isn't technically 
a European thing either. Um, but yeah, no, your point is well taken. Like there was a thing <laughs> before the Bible <laughs> that inspired the Bible. Really Don't interestingly enough, started. like jumping onto that for a second, um, it, they, like looking at the archaeological record, there was an area which is now, I think it's the North Sea, that, that whole area. Yeah. Um, they've, they've been doing side scanning sonar and they're finding evidence of, of Neolithic settlements or, or settlements that were there during uh, the Ice Age. But as the Ice Age was ending, you know, there, there was a massive flood event, which was, you know, like yeah. people were being forced out of where they had been living for generations and generations. And all that shit's under hundreds of feet of water now. But like, that's, you know, they're, they're finding that like that may have been, you know, these different, that's why there's a flood uh, myths across the world is because there was a m- massive flood event that happened when the ice age ended. And so many different cultures have this in their memory, you know, sort of etched into the, the collective human memory. Well, it, it happened back Racial at the memory, point where right? we hadn't spread out that much. You know, they talk about like the cradle of civilization yeah. uh, region. That's when and where it happened. And then everybody just went in different directions from there. And they took their little flood story with them. Mm. My arms well, pumping because, here. Um, Japan you know. as well is almost entirely coastal and built on earthquake zones. So massive apocalyptic <laughs> floods are a huge part of Japanese culture because they happen yeah. so often. That yeah. too, yeah. Um, but anyway, long story long. <laughs> but uh, good talk, guys. No, this uh, is good shit. Yeah. Do we want to... Um... I'm sorry to disagree with your interpretation of the religious ministry. No, the... not at all. No, I, I, That's what this I mean, is about, Andrea. That's what this is about, yeah. No, I mean, I'll probably when elaborate later. I'll elaborate later on what I think it is about with regard to faith and hope. And it, the religion, you're what? right. The religion... <laughs> and I think the religion part of it is, is I think you kind of nailed it, right? That's kind of just like a, ooh, that's kind of a cool thing over there that I can like l- put on top because it has some like visuals that will resonate it's with people. Exotic. Right. It's more about mm. faith and hope than it is about religion. But and um, Soviet montage. Yeah. And <laughs> Soviet montage. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But anyway, so and Ethan, steampunk where did you want us tanks. to pick up? Steampunk dong tanks. Steampunk dong tanks. tanks. That is my uh, new sorry. band name. That's it. You got it. Right next to Uranium Playpen. <laughs> that's, that's I stole from Jello the Opera to acknowledge it. I thought that was fucking awesome. Okay, I'm going to stop. Though, uh, I mean, you... an interesting time viewing, but completely incomprehensible. And I wanted to see some actual flying whales. I feel robbed. I only saw I know, the shadows. shadows. What the fuck was that? And I am disappointed. <laughs> so, completely guilty. I don't know why it couldn't have been a Dunkley Osteus instead of a Coelacanth. I would have liked to have seen that. Dunk the Osteus instead. That would have completely changed the meaning. I don't think he understood the metaphor. I'll meta your four. Well, as for me... Metaphor, metaphor, <laughs> You can metaphor to water, but you can't make it think. All right, all right. Let's <laughs> let Andy actually talk. As for me, I first saw this film when I was about 11 or 12 because... They, a couple of Australians got the distribution rights to it in 1988, cut the thing up and fitted it around live action settings that they filmed themselves in California to produce this bizarre half animated, half live action film called In the Aftermath, where they tried to make it all make sense. And they added lots of extra speeches and actual people talking and stuff. And it was so weird and so crazy that it messed me up completely. In many ways, this film helped make me who I am today. And for that reason, it's absolutely guilty. <laughs> I feel that I must, in fact, judge this film guilty of... Sorry, something I ate. Um, I mean, uh, guilty. Yes, guilty of Cinemania. In that case, I call this conclave to a close. Uh, clonk, clonk. We'll find you a gavel next time, boss. Thank you. Well, I still don't get it. Look, it's a simple story of... I 
think it's pronounced coelacan. (laughs) (laughs) That episode of the Cinemania Society was written and performed by Zachariah Burks, Ethan Ireland, Andrea Palladino, Andy Slack, Andre Luke Martinez, Hope Bravo, and Daniel Scribner. Produced, mixed, and mastered by Ethan Ireland. Music by Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Sound effects and incidental music, courtesy of Epidemic Sound. Thanks, Epidemic Sound. Visit us at cinemaniasociety.podbean.com for season one and profiles in Cinemania. We have social media for you to join the discussion. We have a subreddit at r slash the Cinemania Society and a Facebook group. If you liked what you heard, head over to Patreon and throw us a few bones. We love making fun stuff for folks to listen to, but it sure isn't free. And anything and everything helps. The Cinemania Society is a product of the Cinemania Society, LLC, and will sue. <laughs>